Good morning. Happy Friday. It's 9 a.m. here in Hong Kong, in Beijing, and in Shanghai. The last China show of the year. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets China Open. I'm David Inglis with Annabelle Drewers. Our top stories this hour: a positive start for Asian stocks ahead of key U.S. inflation data that could fall within the Fed's target band. China's big banks, as well, cutting their deposit rates to battle shrinking margins. Nike stumbling in late trade as earnings miss estimates, and it warns of ongoing challenges in Greater China. Plus, Beijing banning the exports of some rare earth technology, challenging the West on supplies of strategic raw materials. Dave, that's really one of the key focuses, I think, as we head into the session today. You've got those just increasing tensions between the U.S. and China, and now it's really that that front of clean energy again, really being emphasized in these latest curves. Yeah, the the access to some of these, I think it's 13, if I'm not mistaken, sort of metals there, and certainly you did see a reaction overnight in U.S. listed rare earth stocks moving up on the back of that. There's that. There's a lot of the obviously the miners, the gold mining stocks on the back yeah. of that rally, uh, the big banks, uh, because from today, right, they reduced those. Deposit cuts and maybe in lieu of protecting some of those margins as well. Uh, plus cyclicals, we'll see what this rally looks like, and certainly that's uh, in terms of price action. We're looking at an up arrow story. We did see a rally yesterday, by the way, on the CSI 300 in the Shanghai Comp, about one percent. So industrials, uh, consumer staples, consumer discretionary shares all led gains yesterday. Looking like a flat-ish uh, open ahead of today, of course, in terms of like just measuring this pivot trade. Eight weeks of gains in global stocks. We're on track though for six weeks of losses on the CSI 300 uh, sectors in focus. We talked about that. We mentioned Nike, of course. Sports apparel names will be very much in focus. Yields. Okay, let's look at your tens. Japan. We have Oz. We have the U.S. and we have China. We have a seven-year bond auction today in China. We had a big drop in ten-year yields in China yesterday. Hence, we're trading at 261. We're down a further one basis point right now. Currency markets. We're coming off highs in dollar China. We at one point overnight we reached about about the top 716 very very briefly. As you can see, we've we, we've come down from those levels right now. Dollar yen. We had some core inflation numbers coming through today uh, out of Japan, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, in terms of the dollar trend, it's been well, it's another weekly drop. I think we're now two straight. We're about I think five uh, weeks of losses in the last six or so. And Nikkei Climate. What's that? Anyway.、Um, What is that? I'm curious what that is now.、Uh, anyway, commodity markets、uh, <laughs> on the way up. Yeah,、uh, learn something new every day. Iron ore prices at 100 bucks in in Singapore. Iron ore at 138. Actually, that should be the highest of the year. Anyway, it's still elevated levels there. But yes, it takes us straight into some key data coming out of the U.S. later today. Yeah, that's right. We've got the core PCE reading that's going、yeah. to be due, and the question, of course, is whether that's going to be hitting that two percent target that's set by the Fed. Certainly, a lot of the the analysts and economists that we're hearing are saying that yes, the expectation is it's going to be subdued. But of course, it's not just the the the, the inflation reading because you also had those initial jobless claims as well. Of course, the merits of whether or what that reading really signifies, but still、uh, telling us that the the labor market in the, in the U.S. is looking fairly resilient, and so that core inflation. Reading or core PC inflation print is going to be really one to watch later today, and certainly set the direction of, of what we can expect as well from the Fed over the course of next year. One of the data points, of course, they're tracking. Yeah, and certainly what we're at four weeks of gains on Treasuries, and perhaps a softer number might get these bond markets a little bit more excited、uh, than they already are. Okay, now、uh, one of our top stories in China, and you might have seen this announcement yesterday, is that China is halting the export of a range of rare earth technologies that could potentially make it harder for the U.S. and other Western nations to bolster their own supplies. Let's get the details now on the story and others from Jill Desis, our China economy editor, on what we know about this current iteration of this rare earth ban. Yes,、uh, David. So ultimately, what this is、uh, doing is、uh, China is、um, limiting the export of rare earth technologies. So not the rare earths themselves, but actually、mm. the technologies that presumably you would need to actually refine these materials,、mm. turn it into things that you would use for,、um, you know, all types of,、uh, you know, clean energy technology, that kind of thing.、Um, I think what's really important to remember here is that. 
you know, China's really had um, a, a really strong stranglehold on the development of these kinds of technologies over the years. So at this point, um, they're still responsible for, I think, somewhere around two-thirds of actually mining rare earth material, but effectively all um, they're responsible for uh, a lot more of uh, the actual refining of this material to turn it into um, the technologies that we actually use for a lot of these clean energy tech. Um, so this would um, indicate, I think we're still trying to parse through exactly how significant uh, the actual um, you know, export controls are in terms of what this means for um, you know, the uh, clean uh, energy transition mm. abilities of other countries like the United States, like um, you know, other, other regions like Europe. Um, but ultimately, yes, I think that it's really that focus on uh, that idea of um, you know, e restricting the exports of that technology that could potentially frustrate uh, the ambitions of places like the U.S. and Europe to actually uh, develop uh, the refining of um, their own um, rare earths tech. So we'll, we'll have to see how that ultimately develops. But yeah. yeah, I think potentially could be pretty significant. Well, it's all about that increasing competition on clean energy and that's also playing into another segment which is EVs of course and yeah. now we're hearing that, that the US could be looking at tariffs. The question of course is what they really mean given there are already tariffs in place. Yes, exactly. Uh, and I think that the thing with um, you know the U.S. potentially considering um, raising tariffs on Chinese EVs. Look, I mean, during the trade war under the the, the President Donald Trump era, um, you know, the tariffs on electric cars out of China were already raised by about I think 25 percent or so, um, and that really sort of limited the amount of EVs that are entering the market. I mean, you contrast that with Europe, for example, um, which um, is importing a lot more Chinese EVs. There's obviously a big um, anti-subsidy probe going on there that I think has the um, more opportunity to fuel tensions between uh, Europe and China. But I think that's a much different uh, picture than it is in the United States, where uh, the number of Chinese electric cars that are actually coming in is much smaller. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see what develops out of there. I think what's really important to remember with the U.S. is obviously uh, the United States is entering a presidential election year. Um, I think um, for any presidential candidate, it's probably going to be, look good to um, be really tough on China, regardless of how effective those types of tariffs actually are. Uh, so we'll see how those actually develop. But yes, I think that the, the impact of uh, raising tariffs on Chinese uh, electric cars for the U.S. is probably not as significant as an action taken by Europe, for example, would be against um, Chinese electric cars. Let's maybe end at a somewhat positive note here on, on the two. There was a joint, was it a, was it a video call between the two military chiefs, of course? Uh, right? Yes, yes. Yes, between the, the, yes, exactly. Between the, the, the general joint chiefs, I think, is um, uh, and his, his uh, Chinese counterpart. I think that um, really important to remember coming out of that APEC summit in mm. San Francisco, where where, um, you know, Joe Biden, uh, President Xi Jinping uh, obviously met. Uh, one of the big takeaways from that meeting, one of the big accomplishments was supposed to be the reestablishment of high-level military talks between these two countries, which of course uh, were suspended last year after uh, then uh, uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. Yeah. Um, there's a, you know, total freeze on uh, those types of talks. Uh, and then we also obviously saw like a, a, a big ramp up in Chinese uh, military incursions around Taiwan. Um, what uh, this indicates to us at least is that at least if um, you We've got these high-level defense officials that are talking. Uh, certainly very uh, positive development there. I will point out, though, that um, the uh, actual defense secretaries have not had a chance to talk, in part because uh, China, of course, does not have a current uh, uh, defense secretary after uh, Li, Li Shenfu left earlier this year. I think we're still waiting to see whether or not there's um, when there's going to be a replacement there. But this, at least, is a, a positive development here, encouraging sign that maybe they're, they're, we are actually resuming some of those high-level talks between these really critical officials again. All right, Jill, thanks for your time. That was Jill Deesis, our China economy editor. And uh, let's uh, think about uh, really over the course of this year, it has been that impact of geopolitical tensions that's just weighed so much on stocks and kept a lot of investors on the sidelines. So let's discuss with our guest ahead of the open. Of course, we're looking fairly muted here so far in futures. But our guest is Jia He Chen, Chief Investment Officer at Novem RK or RK Technologies. Uh, Jia He, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Talk to us about how much you're expecting those sorts of tensions we were just discussing between the U.S. and China to really inform your investment opinions over the course of next year? Well, for, for this, I mean, the, the, the geopolitical tension between China and the U.S. is definitely not something we want, but uh, it, it doesn't really concern us, basically, because we are, we are a family office that invests our own money in the Chinese currency. So that really doesn't bother us because, you know, there won't be a full-scale war between China and the U.S. So uh, as long as we invest in the Chinese market, then that's fine because we judge our investments by the Chinese currency. So that's for us. We are a local investor. If we are a global investor, uh, we would be much more concerned. But, you know, 
uh, lucky we we are local investor. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think is the thing is that the relation between China and U.S. has not been very good in the past few years. So that might be something that has already been fully priced in the capital market, especially if you look at the Hong Kong market, which means if something bad comes out uh, in 2024, then the market won't be surprised because it's already so bad. But if something turns out to be good, like the talk we just had between the Chinese military and the U.S., maybe the market will rise up. If you look at the valuation, it's amazing. It's been there for you know the lowest valuation in the past 20 to 30 years in the Hong Kong market. Yeah, I think who would have thought we'd be trading at, God forbid, eight times earnings? Uh, how have your how have your investments been? How's your how's your how's performance this year so far? Well, we have been actually been pretty good. We, we got about 10 percent return. I mean, if if you look at all the peer funds and companies, they've been losing like uh, 10 or 20 percent. So we're pre pretty uh, happy about our in investment re result. But I would say is that uh, we shouldn't really be getting uh, just 10 percent. We should get about something about 32, 33 percent because we calculate the growth of the fundamental of our investment portfolio, including things like profit, uh, book uh, value, and the dividend. If you see Warren Buffett, he has been doing that for 50 years. And our book value increased by about 32% this year. So we only got about 10% of market cap increasing. That means the valuation dropped by about 20% this year. Uh, the, the valuation of the market can't keep on dropping by 20% every single year. And that's why we've been confident about, uh, confident about the future. So that sort of investment return of around 10 percent, are you sort of following more of a value strategy? Mm -hmm. What sectors did you pick? Because that sort of performance is sort of standing out. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. It's a, that's a very detailed question. Uh, basically speaking, we pick companies, uh, you know, have a very good fundamental. If we look for the next decade, uh, 10 years later, we know this company will be standing there. You know, the large banks of China, the large port companies, the, the large nuclear plants. We know these companies will be there performing pretty well in the next 10 years. And they have very good valuation. Currently, our pop portfolio is having uh, the P-E ratio of about four times P-E ratio and dividend yield about 8% uh, 8 dividend yield. Uh, and, the, and another thing is that we keep on trading between these companies. We don't just stick to them. I mean, if you stick to them, uh, your fundamental is going to increase by about 15% in a year. That's all. But if you want to get something high, like we have got about 30 to 33% this year, you have to trade, which means one company goes upward and you make some profit and you sell it and allocate the capital to another company, which is cheap and maybe better with the fundamental. So we keep on trading. That, that's why we got all these returns. Yeah, that, that, well, that's, that's how the market works if you do it uh, pr properly. Uh, what, what do you like going into next year? So that strategy has worked this year. Are you making looking to make any changes going into 2024? No, we're not making a big change to our investment. I mean, otherwise, we won't be a fund investing our own money, which is about 200 million right now. Uh, it's all our own money. We don't get any money from our clients. Uh, so we don't change our strategy uh, for the long term. We just uh, keep on looking at how much our uh, portfolio's uh, fundamental increases, the book value, the dividend yield, the profit. If it increased by 20 percent, we say, OK, it's pretty good this year. If it got like 30 or 35 percent, which is something you can achieve in China. I can't do that in America. I mean, it's a very matured market. You can't get a lot of trading opportunities in United States or UK, you can't do that. People are too smart over there. But the market here is, uh, you know, less matured. So you have a lot of opportunities to sell high and buy low. So by doing, keep on doing this, I, I just expect the fundamental right. to increase by about 30% next year. But the, the market cap, who knows? It can go down by 10%. It can go up by 100%. No, nobody knows that. I, I guess in some ways, and, you know, to put it bluntly, if it is a trader's market like it has been this year, it really doesn't matter if the market cap goes up or down. Do you expect it to remain a trader's market uh, next year? Because in some ways, while it works for guys like you, that might work not work for the big institutional investors that will stay away from this Chinese market if, if these dynamics persist. It will always be a trader's market, I think, at least for the next two to three de decades. I mean, if you talk to the investors here, see how they value the companies, you can see not a lot of them are really uh, looking at their stocks like a businessman. I mean, look at your stock like a businessman. Think about how good this business will be in next 20 years. How is the valuation? How is the financial statement? Things like this. And you have to spread over a lot of industries. This is how a businessman thinks. And talk to local investors. You can find about 99 
99% or at least the 95% of them are not thinking like this. I mean, if you go to the United States, the story is different. You have more value investors there. You probably got 70% of the people not thinking like a businessman. But in, in the Chinese market, you've got more investors like this way. So the market is always be a good opportunity for, you know, for traders like a businessman. You, you can find opportunities to sell high and buy low. I'm just taking a look at your notes and I can mm. see that you think that the property sector is going to be a, a short term mm. uh, issue or headwind for Chinese equities. But I'm interested because when I take a look at what other uh, economists and analysts are saying in the market, they're, they're predicting that the property drag is going to extend well into 2024. So what's informing your view? Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, actually, Grugism, I don't think the property sector is going to do too well in 2024 because the government has to set the targets that the property is not for, you know, speculating and gambling, it's for living. So it, you, we're not expecting the property price to keep on rising. But look at this year. I mean, the property market has been, you know, bad enough, probably as bad as the relation between China and U.S. in the past few years. And we still got the GDP growth rate about uh, 5%. So that means if the property market keeps on being like this for next Next year, we'll probably still have the GDP growth of 4 or 5 percent. And the reason behind that is basically because China is still a developing nation. We're having the per capita GDP of about 13,000 USD. That's about one fifth of the United States and one third or one fourth of the UK. So that's a long way to go for our development. That, that, that's a reason. Chen Jiahe, a pleasure to speak with you, sir, and have a happy new year. Uh, we'll speak with you again, Chief Investment Officer at Novum, our key. Technologies, right? Uh, your fix of the day is out. I'll make this quick. Uneventful here, 7.0953. The estimate was what? Really doesn't matter what the estimate is, but I'll say it anyway. 7.1306. So we're steady on the Chinese currency following what's been, I guess, quite a rather turbulent week given the dollar moves we've seen so far. Okay. Uh, just ahead, we will discuss supply chains and the disruptions that are taking place. And we're going really into the industry sector itself and what they're actually seeing, I would say, on the ground. But it's really, frankly, on the water. Uh, with the CEO of Investment for Mandarin Shipping, Tim Huxley, joins us. Yeah, and just ahead of that, we're going to have Nike shares tumbling in after hours trade after a disappointing outlook. The concern around China, the demand in that key market is, is really the primary focus. But counting down, of course, the opens of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen and Hong Kong. And to note as well, trading volumes are well off their 20-day moving averages so far in other markets. So it just tells you perhaps it is finally going into the end of 2023. This is Bloomberg Markets, China Open. We've we'll been watching shares of Nike trading in after hours, that big plunge after the close there. That's after the company, of course, announced it's seeking up to $2 billion in cost savings. Quarterly sales in China, that was the other big watch because they did fall short of expectations. Uh, let's discuss now Sue Keenan joining us from New York. And Sue, despite that sort of disappointing outlook from the CEO from Nike, it's still confident, the company says, on its position in China. They say the China consumer is out on the street and pursuing an active and healthy lifestyle, and that's where they're drawing confidence. However, they are looking to engage in huge cost cutting, up to two billion, by dismissing workers and simplifying the sneaker company's product assortment. And that had the stock down 11 percent in after hours in the U.S. And it's got a lot of related companies and suppliers in Asia in the red. Check out what the CFO. Matt friend had to say on the earnings call that the new outlook reflects a, quote, challenging environment, particularly in greater China and the EMEA, referring to Europe, the Middle East and Africa. He added that there were indications of more cautious consumer behavior around the world. Now, revenue in the quarter was $13.4 billion. That was roughly in line. Sales in the key greater China region came in lower than expected, while earnings per share surpassed Wall Street estimates. Also, they see the full year revenue rising 1 percent after declines in the current quarter and a modest increase, which is what they're saying they expect in the subsequent one. Again, very disappointing report from Nike. Well, let's let's look at the well, let's 
broaden out the view from China, look at region-wide Asia-Pacific. There was a change there in, in the guidance. So what was behind that change? Well, it's hard for them to tell, and this is what analysts are saying, whether it is consumer behavior changes, people pulling back on spending, which they're seeing across many regions, or the fact that in China, a key market, there are now many options, including local brands, for consumers to choose from. Investor concerns about China are a key focus for the sportswear company amid fears of a pullback in consumer spending. As recently as the conference call last quarter, uh, which was in late September, uh, Nike indicated confidence, and they're again indicating confidence in this latest conference call, saying, quote, we feel very good about our position in China, and that hasn't changed in the last 90 days. They're expressing confidence in their ability to compete. But again, there is a concern that there's been slower consumption amid growing unease about China's economic prospects. And so that's why we see the stock down so low in the U.S. and extended trading, uh, suppliers down as well. It'll be interesting to see how Nike opens in the U.S. market Friday. Yeah, uh, probably not good. Uh, Sue, thank you so much. Uh, Sue Keenan in New York for us there. We're looking at the uh, sort of uh, follow-on effect we're seeing here in the region here in Nike and the sports suppliers. We just showed you, of course, some of these names in Korea and in and, and, and Japan. The, uh, to some extent playing out, and it's very early, of course, across some of these apparel and sports and some of the Nike suppliers, related companies essentially listed here in Hong Kong so far. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to watch as well because to some extent you also question perhaps that's also just Chinese consumers preferring local, local brands, brands as yeah. well and, and what sort of impact that's going to Absolutely. be having. Uh, another group of stocks are watching, of course, these Apple suppliers. Look, you're not really seeing much movement so far, but perhaps indicative of what we're going to get in trading today, mm -hmm. uh, fairly range-bound, you could expect. But still, we're keeping a track on these names because Apple has stopped selling the Apple Watch Series 9 and that's Ultra 2 as well, and that's after that patent dispute ban took effect. Uh, the company as well no longer able to repair watch models that are out of warranty. So you're thinking oh. if you're, yeah, a bit of a bummer, right? If you're having one of those watches, you can't get it fixed. No. No, you might have a few complaints for the hotline. But anyway. That's plenty, depressing. <laughs> well, plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Okay, um, the winds are blowing in opposite ways, actually. So here in Hong Kong, we're looking at probably a higher open, so 7 tenths of 1%. We're looking at some, some modest pressure on shore. This is following, of course, quite a decent rally we had yesterday. So uh, we'll see what happens towards the open. Analyst actions very, very quickly. Uh, nothing big to uh, sort of write mom about here, but uh, you have some big banks, of course, coming out with some changes. The China Merchants Bank, I should mention that HS cut to neutral at UBS, and it takes us into some of the sectors we're tracking. So big banks, deposit cut today. EV makers on the back of these reports that we might get more uh, additional tariffs. We talked about the Nike story, rare earth and gold. And yeah, we could see a sixth week of losses across the CSI 300, longest in 11 years. This is Bloomberg. Good morning to our viewers joining us across the region, to the increasingly fewer of you who are still joining us right now as we approach Christmas. Understandable. Uh, in fact, when you take a walk here in the business district in Hong Kong, it's basically me, myself, and I in most cases. Very few people in the streets. A lot of boots still, though. <laughs> well, yeah, cold. it's pretty pretty quiet into the week. But anyway, we can make it interesting, I hope, for the yeah, rest of the day's we'll shows. See. Uh, let's see if that's possible. We're going down, of course, the open here for, for mainland Hong Kong markets. And the outlook, uh, as you were saying, it's a little bit different today. You've got Hong Kong pointing to some gains. Yep. Mainland China still looking to be under pressure here. But the Shanghai Composite continuing to look like it could possibly hit mm. that three-year low. We'll check uh, with the open here what we've got as we start trading. But the, the day really going to be... Uh, 
driven by, of course, you've got that U.S. session we had. We've had Asian equities generally that are moving high here. And then you've got the flip side as well, the CSI 300, uh, fairly flat as we come online so far this morning. The Shanghai Composite, though, are still tracking above that key level, watching 28 86.4, I believe, is the level to watch. Yeah, I only know it up to the decimal point. You know it to <laughs> two digits beyond that. So. <laughs> point four three, I'll actually. To you. I do remember that. Yeah. But anyway, the, the direction for equity so far in the session, again, we're fairly range around. I'm just going to take a quick look at how trading volumes are tracking so far. And we're uh, pretty well off the 20-day the moving averages. Mm. For, for Hong Kong, at least, you're looking about 60% lower at this point in time. The trading volume what we would be on sort of a three-week average. Hong Kong... Or Everyone's maybe, in Japan. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Right. Uh, mainland stocks are, again, weaker or trading volumes are a lot lower. But let's uh, change on, take a look at what individual sectors are doing in China in particular here today. And you are seeing uh, some stocks to watch. And these are also ones to note here because we've got China, of course, uh, banning exports of some rare earth processing technologies. So this is really about that increase in competition we're seeing between the U.S. and China on clean energy. So this exports of a range of rare earth technologies they use for things like batteries and other uh, key technologies. So we are seeing that drop here in some of those stocks at the start of trade. Nike Supplies, of course, the other one we're tracking here because that was the, the earnings that came out just to, uh, after the bell. Big drop in Nike after hours and the company essentially saying it wants to, to push through $2 billion in cost savings. But the big thing that analysts are really tracking, of course, is that that warning they put out from demand from China. And so you are seeing, again, some of these names here are dropping, uh, Dave, as we get online today. Yeah. Um, I think we were down 12 percent after hours at Nike and yeah, some, of the, some of the other related companies. So certainly one group of names to watch as you approach the Friday session in the U.S. Now, uh, back in China, fantastic story, this one that we're talking about next here. So three years ago, uh, policymakers began engineering this gradual slowdown in the country's debt-laden real estate sector to tame really frothy prices and sniff out financial risk. What uh, ended up happening was perhaps it became too effective. Well, you had a meltdown that's really damaged household wealth, it's wrecked offshore bond market, it's deprived local governments of much needed land sales revenue. For more on the story, and really the what we're looking at here are the effects on the broader economy and uh, consumers because of what's happened in the property sector. Joining us here on set, Lulu Chen, who leads our Asia investing coverage. And yeah, Lulu, what metrics do we look at here to, to measure what the impact is? Well, David, to your point, um, the government's effort to uh, snuff out the excess debt in the, gov in the property sector instead of engineering a gradual slowdown, it really has caused destruction in every corner of the economy. And looking at metrics, if you look at property sales, 23 percent down in 2022, estimated to drop another 1.8 trillion dollars, wow. uh, 1.8 trillion yuan, and then also um, for GDP contribution, instead of lifting the economy is actually weighing down on GDP growth, um, down 1.3 percentage points in contribution in 2022. Um, on local government earnings, they're also earning less right now. Um, the total revenue generated in 2022 down 23 percent and also estimated to, to have dropped 18 percent in the first 11 months this year. And that's not counting the amount of jobs that were lost and also the wealth destruction for the property tycoons. Mm. And, of course, the property sector has been such a key driver of Chinese growth. I mean, is there sort of any alternative now to replace that? Well, that's the irony because the government hopes that um, the economy could have been more less reliant on the property sector, boosting consumption. But when people feel poor, they don't spend as much. Bloomberg Economics estimates that with a 5 percent drop in property prices, that it could lead to 19 trillion yuan in household wealth destruction, which would then lead to 430 billion yuan of a reduction in consumption. And by estimates, China's property prices have dropped 8 percent since its peak. And by anecdotal evidence in some cities, that is just much worse. Okay. Um, Lulu, thank you. Sorry, I just feel a little bit affected by that. <laughs> a lot of negative numbers there. Okay. Uh, Lulu Chen, fantastic. Uh, who leads, of course, our Asia yeah, investing coverage there, the broader read across the economy. And this goes into the, the news that we had sort of yesterday, right, where uh, starting today, you have the big banks reducing their deposit rates, maybe in an effort here to salvage some of the margin that's left. And it certainly could also mean that lending rates might 
even fall lower, even ahead. Uh, preserving, of course, those margins, which, as you can see on your screens, are record low. Goldman Sachs had an important and fairly uh, direct uh, note on this, uh, really looking at monetary policy uh, so far this year. So monetary policy, lower rates, more money, uh, largely has yet, and for obvious reasons, have actually yet to achieve the objective set out. Because the transmission effect, people are not borrowing money, right? So even with mortgage rates to the story of Lulu early on, low was in at least 15 years. Um, people are just waiting around still yeah, for things to turn right. around. It's, I think, really one of the key things. You can lead a horse to water, you can't make a drink. And, and, and there's just not enough confidence in the Chinese economy to yeah. really be spurring any sort of demand for, for things like property and other uh, big-ticket mm -hmm. items. So certainly uh, an area we'll continue to be tracking over the course of next year. But uh, let's stick with China because Bloomberg NEF data as well is showing that the country has chalked up more than 18 million EV sales since 2017. So clearly a sector that is doing a little bit better. But oh, uh, accounting for nearly half of the world's total and over four times more than the U.S. But uh, there are ramifications, of course, from that switch from the internal combustion engine and uh, that has consequences as well, uh, far beyond the auto industry. So let's get into that now with the, today's big take uh, following a road trip across China to look at the impact of EV adoption. Let's bring in our Asia transport reporter, Linda Liu, joining us for more. Linda, really fascinating by the sounds of it, this, this road, road trip you were saying, 2,000 kilometers across China over five days. But tell us uh, the findings out of that. Uh, China's high EV adoption rate, does that really mean the end, end of oil as well? Yeah, people are really trying to figure this out because China is the world's biggest crude importing nation and 50% um, of that uh, goes towards the transportation industry. So every EV that people is buying and driving, they're putting a dent into oil consumption and that's going to ripple throughout the world, uh, especially through to the big uh, oil producing nations like uh, in the Middle East, Russia, even the US. Uh, but So on the other hand, um, it's not certain if uh, this momentum is going to keep on growing. Even though the industry consensus is that the peak oil consumption moment uh, for China will come this year, that's uh, really reliant on, um, and the momentum is really reliant on the EV adoption rate being as fast as we've seen in the past few years. And that's just not a given. What so what, what hurdles remain between where we are right now and I guess where you want to be? And I think we just showed a graphic there of just concentration of where you can charge your vehicles. And it changes, of obviously, as you go from the eastern provinces into the central and the southern parts of the country. Yeah, that's the really good point because the next challenge for the Chinese government and automakers is to push EV penetration deeper into the rural areas. Mm. And that's where uh, there's a lack of charging infrastructure and then really freezing cold regions as we're seeing in winter, EVs don't work that great. So that's an uphill, ba uphill battle for the government to push EVs there as the adoption rate saturates in the cities and the other challenge is to make sure you're getting as much as carbon uh, emissions reduction out of these EVs. In China, the technology is developing at such a breakneck speed. The cars aren't driven uh, for very long, maybe less than 10 years, mm. and that's actually not going to realize the benefits they may bring because to manufacture an EV it actually takes more carbon emissions than internal combustion engines. I'm interested as well because you're just talking about trying to, t trying to penetrate further into the local market. What about finding growth drivers in other markets? Because uh, the U.S. is one that, that seems like Chinese EV makers have, have faced a lot of hurdles so far. That's right. Now Chinese EV makers are really keenly expanding overseas as the growth stagnates in the domestic market. Uh, they're going to places like Southeast Asia, Europe, but U.S. has remained largely off limits due to the 25 percent input tariff that Trump imposed and which Biden has kept on. And now they're even considering raising that tariff. So for the Chinese automakers in the short term, they're not going to see a lot of change in this dynamic. But over the long term, uh, being shut off the world's second largest auto market, that's going to be a loss. Linda, thank you so much. Linda Liu there, our transport reporter, who unfortunately did not join that road trip, but of course uh, some of our colleagues did, of course. Try and get your tickets on the next one. Yeah. <laughs> Look forward to it. We'll go further west. Yeah. Yeah. We'll beat out that current, yeah. that current one. Okay, uh, you can read about that story 
that epic road trip about China's EV rates and the country's energy transition. That's a topic of today's Big Take. Take a look at that on the terminal for our clients, also on Bloomberg.com. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Happy Friday, by the way. Okay, welcome back. So we're looking at um, energy prices right now. So Brent's all, all the way down to Shanghai crude. And it, it's worth noting, certainly, well, a couple of things here. So Angola was the big news, of course, in the old story, quitting OPEC amid this, uh, these fractions that are, uh, factions that are taking place. Fraction, sorry. Okay, that's a, an energy term. Uh, the other one is certainly amid decline in energy prices, we're actually on track for a weekly gain in oil. And maybe we can point to what's been happening in one part of the world, the Red Sea. There. Yeah, that's right. I mean, a, a lot of that focus has been on the Suez Canal, but there's yeah. also, when you take a look at energy markets, there's another part that you also need to be taking a look at as well, and that's the Bab al-Mandab Strait. Mm. So you have the Red Sea, this lies at the southern end, and that's really where a lot of those tankers are passing through. So really crucial conduit for energy supplies. But this chart here, really putting it in perspective for us, because you've seen a huge drop-off in tankers that are entering that area. So only about 30 or so are expected to have gone through over the past few days, and that's about 40 percent lower than where we would be on typical volume. So uh, certainly it is that energy headwind, perhaps, of course, the longer that this sort of disruption mm. stretches on, probably the more significant we'll see it becoming. The drop as well. It, it's also worth mentioning, I think this is a great story, too, because ships can actually turn off the AIS signal because of yeah. security reasons. So they might actually drop off the data, which might means they're under radar, of course. Sort of but that goes into the security it, risk as yes, well. Yes, yeah. Uh, happening there. Uh, for more context on really what's happening here and perhaps also the outlook for the shipping sector going into next year, Tim Huxley joining us here in SET, Chairman and CEO at Shipping Investment for Mandarin Shipping. Good morning. How's, uh, well, let's start with Red Sea. Uh, you're not seeing any impact. I, you guys don't really pass through that part of the world, do you? We don't have ships that are actually in the Red Sea, but okay. of course it has a knock on effect on. Mm -hmm ships all around the world. Yeah. I mean, supply chains are stretched to the limit. So if you get one kink in the supply chain, mm. it's going to have a knock-on effect. It just takes a bit of time to come through. Uh, certainly the size of ships that we operate, I mean, which are feeder container ships trading mainly in Asia, uh, initially uh, it was only the bigger ships that go through sewers that were having, uh, that were getting affected by this and seeing their rates going up. But I mean, yesterday there was a report of a uh, feeder container ship uh, being chartered for inter Red Sea trading uh, at a rate that was 40% above what it was getting last week. Wow. So, mm -hmm. you know, wow. costs are going to go up. But at the moment, it's, uh, it's not having a massive effect on the, on the regional, regional trades just yet, but it will do. So put it in context for us then, given your, your multi-years multi in this industry, how significant is the scale of this out of other historical events like COVID, for instance? Uh, it's not nearly as bad as COVID so far, but this is an evolving situation uh, and things can change quite quickly. 12% I mean, of global trade goes through the Suez Canal, so any blockage there is going to be pretty significant. Uh, but, you know, let's just look back. I mean, in 1956, uh, you had the Suez Crisis. And then between 67 and 74, the canal was closed. That was for seven years. So we can live without it. And of course, you can still get cargo uh, round Cape Horn. Yeah. So uh, it's, but it, it is very significant. And it will lead, if this goes on for a long time, because you've now got, uh, certainly in the container sector, 70% of the world's uh, container lines have said we're not going in there uh, and they're going to reroute around the Cape. So that will have a significant impact on on trade. Uh, I guess two follow-up questions there. One is if this does become prolonged and hopefully not, uh, you mentioned 40 percent increase. Is that a benchmark we can use as you know in terms of how much costs could go up? That's number no, one. Not uh, not at this stage. Okay, go ahead. Uh, because I mean that is really a ship that is trading within the Red Sea. Okay. Uh, if you look at uh, I mean, during COVID, container shipping rates went up far, far more. But uh, the shipping industry did what it always does when it's making a lot of money, which is it went to build too many ships. Yeah. So you've now got 20% of the world's fleet of container ships. This isn't the case for bulk carriers and tankers. 20% of the container ships are sitting in shipyards being built. So they're coming up. So if anything this does, it might absorb some of this additional capacity that's coming on. 
That additional capacity, though, how does that sort of feed into your into your outlook for 2024? Of course, there's the, the tanker owners, there's bulk carriers, there's different types of ships. Mm. What are you seeing? Uh, container ships, with this big influx of, of new ships, they will probably still have quite a, a challenging year ahead. Although you get ships that are then going to be recycled, and you know we are hopeful of improved trade growth, and we've seen some much more positive economic indicators coming out. So it might not... I'm reasonably optimistic, but then ship owners always are. Uh, <laughs> you have to be. Uh, in bulk carriers and tankers, what you've got is you've actually got quite a limited supply. I mean, the, in bulk carriers, the order book, it's below 7%. Uh, that's still probably a bit more than we've got in actual trade growth. But with all of the green transition and everything that's coming on, uh, there is reasonable... Is, there's a re reasonable reason to be fairly optimistic for next year. I think next year will be better than this year's been. Yeah, well, a lot more optimistic than people in the shipping industry, maybe, to, yeah. to, your, to your earlier, uh, just to banter you there. Now, I was going to ask you, too, about what are you seeing as far as demand? Because people talk about we're headed into a slowdown next year globally. You know, interest rates have been jacked up to the ceiling. China's not doing as well. Yeah. What are you seeing recently on trade activity? Um, Cargo volumes and raw materials this year going into China have actually been pretty strong. Uh, and um, you know, that's, that's the major bulk commodities of coal and iron ore. Mm. Now, one of the things that you will see with this disruption, whether it be in the Suez Canal or in addition, you've got the Panama Canal, which yes. has got problems at the moment. There's no water. With there's no water. So that's going down. So that will have a particular impact on global grain trades. Mm. Mm which is a very important driver of bulk shipping. So the realignment of particular trade routes, that could have quite a positive impact on shipping going forward. But at the moment, as I say, all of these uh, situations, they are evolving. Uh, Suez, it's... Uh, We've got the, uh, you know, the, na the coalition naval force going there, how long that will take. And if you, but if you look back historically, when we had the problem with the Somali pirates uh, a few years ago, mm. uh, again, the coalition, that did actually bring that under control. But it was, it was a pretty dramatic uh, situation for quite a long time. And I think this will probably go on for longer than we expect. I'm interested because you mentioned Panama and, and it is that key question really of climate change disruptions to the shipping industry as well. What is being done so far to sort of mitigate that? Are there, are there any sort of adjustments that could be made to ships in the, in the building process, for instance, mm. to try and offset that? Shipping accounts for about 3% of global emissions. Uh, which actually, when you think of the value it adds, it's, into... it's not a question though on emissions. I'm talking more about like the response in terms of like the actual practical solution to try and the... deal with it. Yeah, sure. And that that's that's a, a very good point because what has happened is that over the last eight or nine years, the incremental uh, efficiencies that have been built into the shipping industry have meant that basically ships are about 60 percent more efficient than they were 12 12 years ago. So. You are actually getting, getting it uh, to being a much more efficient industry, which at the same time it already is. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to move that amount of cargo any other way uh, than, than by sea. Okay. Inter but just but in, the, in terms of the technical spe speci specification of the ship, is there any sort of change that's been made? Oh, yeah, that, do we need that, to build different ships? We, well, not well, you are making a lot of advances in different uh, fuel systems, but those are actually quite difficult to get into place, like hydrogen, ammonia, everything. Right. And there are many other industries that are actually going to have strong demand for those fuels, mm. <coughs> like aviation, for instance. So you're always going to need the shipping industry. Not They will try to use those fuels, <laughs> but at the same time, you've got to move the fuels to the other... Because the biggest problem right. is you've got the infrastructure that just isn't there. So, mm. But within the shipping industry, things like uh, revised propellers... Uh, paint systems, uh, the shape of the bow of a ship, all of these have been big incremental uh, additions to, to really reducing fuel consumption. 
All right, Tim, thanks very much for your time. That was Fantastic. Tim Huxley, Chairman and CEO of shipping investment firm Mandarin Shipping. And uh, more stories we're tracking as well this morning. There's the Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. saying his country will continue to assert its rights in the South China Sea. That's after Beijing warned Manila against causing trouble in the area. Their vessels have clashed several times recently in the disputed waters. Meanwhile, China's top military official held a video call with his U.S. counterpart, urging Be Washington to respect Beijing's sovereignty and interests in the South China Sea. We'll have plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. The Fed is going to need to see uh, at least two or three months more of continued improvement. I think tomorrow will probably be good news, but they're going to need to see sustained improvement before they're going to will be willing to take more action. And, uh, and so I, I think the market should expect that it's going to take a while and more sustained improvement before the Fed does something. That was the former Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan speaking with Bloomberg Television earlier this morning. And, uh, of course, a lot of different reactions that we're getting through and, and traders really reacting to what's been a pretty interesting week for Fed speak, really, because it's been that, that story of, of Fed officials really seeking to push back on that, that uh, PAL pivot, really, that came through last week, that unexpectedly dovish commentary. It's the question as well, because I was reading early this morning about, about the number of inflation signals out there that are telling us perhaps price pressures will be reignited over the course of next year. So could, go there. <laughs> so <laughs> could the Fed cuts? That's the yeah. question. Are they going to be coming at exactly the wrong time for markets? Okay, that's, that's, that's good to bring up. Just well, shadowing 2024, you yeah. get us interested for next year. It's this type <laughs> of environment where, you know, a lot of these risks, perhaps hidden risks that are not too obvious, that sort of take a backseat. That's a very good point to bring up, certainly going into next year, when everyone's sort of single-mindedly looking at rate cuts, right? Hence, we're looking at a four-week rally in Treasuries. Anyway, food for thought. This is Bloomberg.